from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. In the interest of making digital preservation a little more difficult, I have no slides. Uh, uh, but uh, hopefully what I say will uh, strike some sparks. Uh, I had a wonderful conversation once with Freeman Dyson about digital preservation. And he said, oh, forgetting is so important. <laughs> uh, it makes room for new things. So it's something we always have to keep in, in one, uh, one hand, even as we think about preservation. I wanted to tell you a few personal stories uh, today, and hopefully stories that will provoke some lines of discussion uh, over the course of the meeting and, of course, in the, in the panel. Uh, the first uh, concerns a couple of personal failures of digital preservation in the work that we do at O'Reilly. Uh, the first one was in 1993. Uh, we created the first ever commercial website. It was called the Global Network Navigator. And it had the first ever advertisements on the World Wide Web. And about seven or eight years later, uh, somebody was asking us, what did they look like? And we couldn't remember. And we didn't have any copies. This is before the Internet Archive, Wayback Machine. You know, and we finally found a print brochure that had a picture. You know, and then it was like, oh yeah, it came flooding back. But so much had happened that we, you know, we couldn't even remember. You know, and, you know, they weren't actually banner ads because, of course, we were so early. There were only about 200 websites when we launched this thing, and so the first ads, in fact, were buttons that pointed to catalog entries, which were effectively where we were hosting somebody's web content. The very first advertiser, by the way, was a Silicon Valley law firm named Heller, uh, Ehrman, White, McAuliffe. It was our our lawyer at the time. And uh, <laughs> uh, we thought about keeping his uh, $5,000 check, but then we thought, no, we need the money. Uh, so, uh, but that history was lost. There are no copies of that first commercial website. And the reason I mention that is because often the things that turn out to be historic are not known to be historic at the time. You know, we weren't thinking, oh, yeah, this is worthy of preservation. We were just doing it. We we're, you know, some, you know, this crazy little technical documentation company that had this idea of how we could do something different with the World Wide Web. And um, so that's really uh, probably the first and most important thing, which is that you can't necessarily do preservation uh, from an institutional uh, point of view. You know, we're librarians, we're preservationists, we're going to go out and find all the stuff that's important. You have to kind of teach preservation as a mindset. And you also have, I, I believe, to actually bake preservation into the tools that people use. I'll come to that later. Uh, because nobody, uh, you know, who was paying attention to the future of technology would have thought, oh, wow, we've got to go pay attention to what these guys at this little company in this new technology that nobody's heard of uh, you know, would say, oh yeah, that was important. It ought to be preserved. We had to preserve it. and We had to have an environment that preserved it. You know, if you contrast that, for example, uh, with Wikipedia. You know, uh, you know, Wikipedia has uh, version control built in. You can go back and see the very beginnings of Wikipedia. You can go back and see the very beginning of every Wikipedia entry because it's a system that's designed to include digital preservation. Now, they do it because it's, they didn't do it for digital preservation purposes, but they did it nonetheless. Uh, and I think uh, there's, a, there's a lesson there, uh, which is to des design more systems that actually have their own memory and their own preservation. Now, it's certainly true that it, you know, a site can go away, uh, and, and even then that kind of version control memory that you see in Wikipedia or in software development sites like GitHub uh, wouldn't be enough, uh, but it's the first line of defense. So my second story concerns uh, a second failure of preservation on my part. We held uh, an event in 1998 that was originally called the Freeware Summit, later came to be called the Open Source Summit, because it was at that meeting that a group of free software leaders came together and had a vote 
and decided that they would start using this new term, open source software. And we knew this was a historic event, and so we kind of built an archive of some of the coverage. Uh, some of it was in print, and we, we kept, you know, print copies, uh, although God knows where they are. Um, but we foolishly didn't actually make sure that we had copies of every destination of every link in those articles. And so, you know, some years later, I went back to look at some of the coverage uh, to which I'd sa carefully saved links, only to discover that the link that once pointed to an article in Dr. Dobbs' journal about the Open Source Summit now points to some advertising page where Dr. Dobbs, who's taken down the content, is still trying to harvest a little bit of advertising revenue off the link, and all that's there is an advertisement. Uh, you know, so, you know, even though we tried uh, to preserve some of that history, uh, it's very spotty now. Some of the uh, pieces we actually have complete documents. Other uh, places we have uh, links that are 404. Other places we have links that don't go where they originally went. And that was in 1998. You know, I, I think now there's a far greater awareness of the fact that sites go away. Uh, that people redirect links, but we haven't really built any better tools for archiving and institutionalizing uh, that coverage. I think uh, 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 there's a lot that needs to be done uh, to make that memory as easy as the memory of replaying a Wikipedia entry. And so I would, again, urge you to think about what kind of tools do we need in uh, in the everyday practice of the digital world uh, that actually do lead to preservation and increase uh, preservation. Because people aren't going to always know what's important, or people who do know aren't always going to do the right thing. The next story I want to tell you uh, is a very different kind of preservation story. This uh, is an experience that happened to me only uh, a month or two ago. It was late May. I was going to an event on the far side of the Sierra Nevada from uh, San Francisco. It was a hot day. Uh, I had no idea that the Sierra Passes would be closed due to snow. You know, I mean, who knew? It was 90 degrees where I was. I don't go through very often. I didn't realize that the Sierra Passes are still closed. So I f blindly follow the directions of Google Maps only to get high up into the mountains. And it says, you know, road closed five miles ahead. I then tried to, um, it was very hard on it. I just had my phone, very small screen. I tried very hard to um, figure out a route that would take me not through the mountains, but a little bit around the mountains to a major route, road that I thought, oh, that must certainly be open. Uh, unfortunately, because of the small screen, Google Maps took me another route that ended up at a closed road. Now, there was a little warning in there, the road may be closed. But in fact, all of the roads, including the ones that were open, had that warning. So there's a little lesson there for Google. You know, there's some things you could get right. Uh, <laughs> but the, the digital preservation story I want to tell you was that after the second failure of Google Maps, I stopped at a gas station to see if they had any paper maps. And they didn't. There were some old spin, there were some spinner racks with a few barely remaining, you know, those, you know, places that were nowhere near where I was. And it was clear that paper maps were no longer expected to be available. It got worse because eventually I found my way to Highway 50, got up through South Lake Tahoe and on towards my destination, at which point uh, my Google Maps app on my phone crashed. And I was out of cell range, and I basically went, had to go back to the old-fashioned method of uh, asking people for directions. <laughs> uh, it worked. But why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you this story because I think there's going to be a whole new dimension of digital preservation. Just as those maps had gone away from the gas station I visited, I want you to imagine a world in which Books have gone away, and there are only e-books. Uh, and I want you to imagine what happens in circumstances 
when you can't get at a digital copy or where a digital copy is not good enough. You know, part of the reason I wanted a, a, a physical map was because I, I needed more real estate to see the big picture of where I was going. And it was very hard to do on the small screen. And the reason I'm concerned about this is that I, I think it's very hard for all of us who've grown up in a world of books and other printed materials to imagine a world in which they won't exist. But I'm concerned that that world may be closer than we think. And I want to put this in the context of, of a discipline called scenario planning. Um, the people who originally developed this, uh, people like P Peter Schwartz and, um, uh, and, and like at Global Business Network, they originally worked with the oil industry. And uh, the, the classic scenario planning story is of an oil drilling company that was trying to do scenarios of, you know, well, production would be like this, or it would be like this, or it would be like this. And it turned out that this particular period, oil production went like that. And the reason it went like that was because it turned out there was some particular tax provision that favored investment in oil drilling. And so there were all these dentists and doctors and real estate people who were putting their money into you know, oil drilling businesses. You know, Congress repealed that tax break, and bang, just investment just went poof. And, and that was the, the origin, as they tell it, of this idea that you need to actually think about widely divergent scenarios. So whether I'm right or not, I want you to imagine a world in which print doesn't exist and how that changes how you might think about digital preservation and the mission that you have and the kinds of targets that you might have and how you might actually incorporate print of things that were formerly digital only into a digital preservation strategy. Um, and let me just give you a little bit of data from my own experience that makes me think that, um, you know, how, how radically uh, the book marketplace may change over the next decade. Uh, you guys have all seen, obviously, that borders went out of business. Um, but what you might not realize is that for many categories, you know, I mean, it's, it's different, you know, there's certainly, you know, Romance novels, for example, are sold in you know, supermarkets. Uh, but there are many classes of books for which Amazon is now 50, 60 percent of the market. And Amazon is pretty clearly set on becoming a, an all digital company. They, they like the margins better. Uh, they like the control better. So just put that in and think about that for a minute. You know, a company that now controls you know, 50 to 60% of the market for many types of books wants to be all digital. And add to that some understanding of the economics of print for publishers. A lot of people, you know, look at ebooks and they go, wow, this is, is way better. There's no inventory cost, there's no manufacturing cost, there's no distribution cost. Uh, but it turns out that digital actually increases the cost of print. You know, so, for example, when we used to print 10,000 copies of a book, we might pay $2 for it. Now we might print one or 2,000 copies and we pay $10 for it. Right? So even though we're, we're printing a fraction of the number of copies, our manufacturing cost is much higher. And uh, for us, the development cost of a book is far more significant in any case than the, the print cost. And even though the physical distribution costs go away, the digital distribution costs are fairly comparable because, of course, there's intermediaries there who want their cut. And you know, as a result of those economics, there is a tipping point in which somebody says, wow, it's just not worth it to produce this kind of book anymore. Uh, and it's not linear. It's not like you have a gradual decline. It's a lot more like that scenario I talked about where there could be a point where it's, you know, you know, we have this nice crossover where digital books are going up and print books are coming down. And in an ideal scenario, there's sort of a smooth landing. But I think for many categories, it's going to be much more like digital is coming up, print is coming down, and then print falls off a cliff. You know, because you just say, wow, 
uh, you know, there's just not enough volume for me uh, to continue to produce that in print. There's not enough places to sell it. Uh, it's not worth it. There are also some ecosystem-like dependencies in the book market that you don't think about. Uh, even though, uh, you know, Amazon is a large part of the market, there is a small amount of the total surface area that you used to have for people to be exposed to product. Uh, you know, for all the talk of the long tail, and it really is there. Search does give you access to titles that you would never find in a print bookstore. There are still issues when, you know, your search and your, your merchandising of a few screens worth uh, are the primary way that people encounter, uh, you know, a product. You know, physical bookstores used to give a great deal of surface area for marketing. So I, my point there is that I think that the book market as we know it uh, could be very, 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 very different in, in uh, less than a decade, maybe even considerably less than a decade, maybe in five years. And so I don't know what that means for you in digital preservation. And I know you're mainly thinking about the preservation of uh, digital assets, but here's a, a huge category that used to be somebody else's problem, right? Because it was, uh, it was a print asset, and there were people who took care of preserving print assets. But now, all of a sudden, that whole world is also going to be digital-only assets. So, just you got to put that into your your plans, and then come back to my story about the Sierras, and think a little bit about what kinds of assets that once appeared in print uh, are now no longer available in print uh, should be preserved in some way that makes them accessible uh, to people in the event of uh, the lack of access to the internet? Uh, you know, what would we need? And I think, you know, certainly I, I think about that personally. You know, what books would I want to have if I couldn't get onto the internet? Do I want to have zero? No, certainly not. Do I want to have as many as I used to have? Uh, probably not. But there's a new world coming, and it's worth using that to sort of shape your thinking of what you collect and how. But I think of all the things that I've kind of suggested as food for thought, the thing I would really like uh, to suggest most significantly is this idea of having preservation baked into the tools that we use. And I don't th mean by that, uh, you know, that you know, we'll build tools that are necessarily at the level of scholarly preservation that perhaps some of you think about, uh, or long-term preservation, uh, but really just tools that make it more likely that things will survive. You know, I use that example, uh, again, of uh, Wikipedia, uh, or of the way software is now uh, shared and saved on um, social coding sites like GitHub. And I would love to see an initiative you know, at, at a very deep level uh, to think about what the web's memory ought to look like. And, uh, and then secondarily, you know, there's sort of an effort to increase the consciousness of people uh, when they're involved in anything of interest, that there is an obligation, in some sense, to uh, preserve what matters. And of course, that causes us all to think about, well, what matters? And that's a very personal decision. And I, I think that um, the, what you, you do is so important as a mindset. Uh, you know, preservation uh, is something that you know, we just often discover it too late, you know, when something is gone. You know, how many would love to have another poem of Sappho? How many would love to have, uh, you know, the lost paintings, the lost poems, uh, the lost art of the past? And yet, you know, we're engaged in the wholesale destruction of our own history uh, because we aren't thinking about what we do as important to our descendants. And so, 
you know, I, I think all of you in this room have far more answers than I do. Uh, all I would just encourage you to do is to think of yourselves not as uh, people in this sort of niche scholarly profession, but of people who are engaged in a task that really matters for everyone. Because as we move to an all digital world, uh, or a, a largely digital world, digital preservation won't be just the concern of specialists. It will be a concern of everyone's. Thank you. So we'll do Q and A is during the the. Oh, we can take a. We have a couple of minutes if you want to take a couple of questions. Okay. If anybody has questions, I'm happy to, to say more now. Over here. Uh, I can hear you. <laughs> rescuing stuff. Um, uh, there was uh, Andre Kudrescu's journal, uh, The Exquisite Corpse, yeah. um, was lost. Uh, they, they, the the um, servers were lost in the, in the Katrina. Uh -huh. And uh, we gave the content back to them because Lox had collected it. And this illustrates the problem because the reason why it was lost was because the people who were publishing Andre Kordescu's stuff are not exactly tech savvy about tools. Yeah. But that's the big problem is that the, 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 the stuff that's going to get lost is the stuff that's produced by people who are not savvy about the tools. Yeah. Anybody who's savvy about the tools, immediately the risk of losing their stuff goes down enormously. Yeah. And you know the stuff that's published through O'Reilly or yeah. in our case Elsevier or whatever is yeah. not going away. Right. The stuff that's published by Andre Andre Kudrescu is at high risk. Yeah. And it's how do you get the how do you get the tools to the people who don't care about the tools? Yeah. Well, that's a really good point. And uh, of course, it depends too whether so we're looking for his original manuscript or his later published work. I assume it was sort of some of his original working material. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, clearly, and I, I think what, what you know, Brewster has done with archive.org is an important uh, outside step. You know, somebody else should archive it. It's also why I think it's great that Google crawls the web and, uh, you know, people who push back against uh, what they're doing are, are foolish. It's, it's uh, great to have that belts and suspenders uh, approach. Uh, you know, to your point about it being tech, non-tech savvy people, it's not just that. Uh, a, a good example I was involved in uh, was uh, apparently I was, did a little bit of work with the Computer History Museum. Uh, there was a mailing list, and somebody remarked that Don Knuth, a famous computer scientist, had said that he thought that Mac Paint. How many of you here remember Mac Paint? Uh, uh, Bill Atkins's Mac Paint was the most beautiful program ever written, and nobody had the source code. And uh, it, it, so eventually, somebody turned up, you know, some old floppies and old old disk. And and uh, Andy Hertzfeld, who was another early Mac developer, actually, uh, you know, got the source code and donated it to the Computer History Museum. Uh, you know, and it was a little bit of a controversy. We had to find somebody who would kind of take the heat in case Steve Jobs was mad, because it wasn't it wasn't really not done without with with permission. But it was sort of like, no, you know, if, if Donald Knuth says this is the most beautiful program ever written, it really needs to be in the Computer History Museum, and let's do it and ask for forgiveness <laughs> later. But, you know, uh, you know, there is this whole thing. It goes back to the kind of the ethics of preservation. You know, there are uh, things in, in, you know, in my field in software where the company goes out of business or the software is no longer sold. And I remember there was an article once written uh, about, so this, you know, one of the imperatives for open source is just simply to preserve stuff. You know, it's like, you know, you may not want it anymore, but pass it on. And that obligation to make sure that even though you're not supporting a program or supporting some, a website or, you know, that, that if there is another home for it, that you uh, take some effort to pass it on. Yeah, but anyway, great work on rescuing that little piece. What, what did you learn from that? that
so um, the big problem we have is that to do long-term preservation the way we do it, we need permission from the copyright owners. Yeah. And uh, that means that we have to get them to put something up on the website that, uh, that gives us permission. Mm -hmm. And uh, they keep forgetting to do that or redesigning the website and moving it so we don't know where it is any longer. And um, so there have been gaps in our coverage of, of uh, Andrei Kordescu's stuff. It's because it keeps evolving and <coughs> every time it changes, that means we have to do some work and we're a small team at Stanford who <laughs> we just have a lot of backlog. Kind of makes and you think that there ought to be a preservation uh, exception kind of akin to fair use. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yes. And, and just one, one, more, one more comment while I have the mic is that, that your point about open source software is actually very, really important. And one thing that I've been arguing for a long time is asking why aren't the national libraries preserving the contents of the open source repositories like SourceForge and so on. There are no legal difficulties in doing it. The technology is trivial. It contains the infrastructure for all your digital preservation projects, and, no, and the national libraries aren't doing it. Wow, that's a really important point. I think, and part of it is because we haven't yet expanded our uh, sort of sense of what are important cultural artifacts to include software. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, well, in fact, it is the art form of this age. <laughs> yeah. S -s -s oh. All right, I think we're, prob oh wait. So, uh, so I get, just quickly, get back to the point about uh, uh, the importance of, of forgetting. Mm -hmm. um, it, it occurs to me that, um, just to make an analogy with another, you say, his art form, um, his art form like music, performing, symphonies, um, it's there accepted that some, even great performances, mostly will not be recorded, yeah. will be remembered, in fact, we make laws against recording them, except when it's on purpose, when, when we're doing it uh, mm -hmm. uh, on purpose. And, and there's a question whether every program, even one in SourceForge, uh, you know, sure, it's a performance, but is it really worth putting the effort into to preserving? Yeah. Um, there was a lot of radio that happened. Some of it was recorded, but we don't mourn too much over the stuff that was lost. I would, I would like to hear Wolfman Jack, uh, you know, uh, but, but okay. But, but there is a point about the distinction, which we haven't really made very closely because our dissemination was pretty good as archive also when we had paper. Mm -hmm. But maybe part of the issue is, I think, the, the, the idea that everything, that we want to preserve everything, may get in the way of our preserving the things that we really need to focus on. Yeah, I, I think there's certainly some truth to that. I mean, you know, to, back to Freeman's point, you know, his idea was the way the brain works, we remember stuff that's important to us, and yeah, sometimes we forget stuff that's important to us, but on the whole, it works. And there is a way that I think the internet does replicate that to some extent. The things that are really popular are going to have lots and lots of copies made. There's going to be somebody squirreled away, somebody saved it on their hard disk, and there's you know, thousands, if not millions, of copies of some things. And some of them will definitely be preserved. And as in that Mac Paint story, you can kind of put out an appeal and say, we're looking, does anybody have a saved copy of such and such? And sometimes that will uh, come forward. Um, and, and, and if nobody cared enough to save it, maybe that's OK. Um, and it certainly gives future historians something to do. <laughs> so then, of course, when you find something, it's great. <laughs> Over here. I have two comments, and one, one of those I hope you can at least give me a reaction to. Uh, one of the things I've noted in the past year or two is that the, the concept of WYSIWYG has gone away. Uh, where if I wanted to preserve a web page that I had seen because I want to save it, a, an article in the New York Times or something like that, if I hit print and I hit print to PDF, I can no longer print the page that I actually see. It is now formatted differently. Yeah. And so preservation can mean different things depending on what you're doing at the time, depending on the code that it's running, depending on a number of different factors. And I think we're just starting to see 
what that really means, in other words, the different software types, JavaScript versus HTML, the different toolkits. Yeah. And I wonder if you have any reaction to that, and then I have one other comment. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a really good point. You know, we, if you want to preserve the presentation, which often is very important, you know, what are your options? You can take a screenshot, uh, and then you only have part of the content, and it's not accessible and not searchable in various other ways. Uh, yeah, and, and so many times the, the, the print version is very, very different. Uh, I, yeah, I don't really know the, the answer to that. And then my other, my other question was, uh, or my other comment was, uh, I deal with digital preservation from an engineering perspective, and so I love your books for a very different reason. Mm -hmm. um, because I actually understand a lot more of the deep dive, and they 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 tend to connect a lot of things that um, the technical yeah. documentation doesn't. But the one thing that has been impressed upon me since I've been dealing with preservation and digital preservation since coming out of industry is that all digital preservation, when you really boil it down, is actually physical preservation because those bits are stored somewhere. Yeah. It may be a hard drive, it may be an optical disk, it may be a data tape, but in the end, all data preservation is physical preservation, it's just a different type of physical preservation. Yeah. That's a tweetable uh, comment, by the way, everybody should write it. That should Thank go out you. here. All, all, all data preservation is physical preservation. Yeah, I agree. All right, I think we should probably wrap now. All right, and, and uh, I'll be back up during the panel. Thank you very, very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.